This is Norman Granz, and here's a memo to place beside your radio for good listening to come. Jazz at the Philharmonic, a series of jazz classics performed by outstanding stars of the jazz world, will be coming to you over this station very soon. So listen to your local announcer for the day and the time. You'll be hearing Charlie Parker, Stan Getz, the fabulous Ella Fitzgerald, Oscar Peterson, and other stars. Be sure to listen. Billboard Magazine, August 18, 1956. Thesaurus and Pact for Grants Transcriptions, New York. A Jazz at the Philharmonic transcribed show, believed to be the first all jazz show, will be released to station subscribers next month by RCA Thesaurus. Thesaurus exec Ben Sullivan recently signed a deal with Jazz at the Philharmonic impresario Norman Grants, whereby the transcription outfit gains access to many of the recordings cut by Grants for his Clef. Norgran, Verve, and Down Home labels. These include platters by such greats as Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Stan Getz, Oscar Peterson, Art Tatum, Roy Eldridge, Gene Krupa, and many others. Grands himself was in town last week to tape voice tracks, which will be packaged on three separate platters and shipped to stations along with seven 12 inch LPs. These have been cut in a matter that will enable local disc jockeys to conduct a realistic interview with Grants with the aid of a timed transcript. His commentary is informative and often candid and provocative. The talk is also available in patterns that will enable a station to run a complete jazz show with Norman Grant serving as MC. Welcome to the Jazz at the Philharmonic radio show. This radio program was put together in conjunction with RCA Thesaurus and it consisted of a number of albums of jazz musicians and um, an interview with Norman Granz. So, before we play any of the music, let's go to the interview itself. Let's hear from the man behind all of this music, Mr. Norman Granz. When was jazz at the Philharmonic first established? Well, its roots lie in the jam sessions that I began in 1940, though the first jazz at the Philharmonic concert, that is one that was called that, was in 1944. What is your own personal background in jazz? Primarily, I was a fan, and I still am. I used to collect records, and I went around and heard musicians in jam sessions. And then in 1940, when I was in college, I began jam sessions of my own on the West Coast. Would you be so kind as to explain to our listening audience a little bit about the origins of jazz at Philharmonic? What was the inspiration behind your creation of it? Well, jazz at the Philharmonic uh, rested at the time I began and still does upon three foundations. One was I felt that jazz could be used as a sociological weapon in terms of fighting discrimination, and it still does that. The other was that I liked jazz, and I liked the idea of presenting jazz, and third, I enjoyed the idea of making money, and it does that. Does one have to be an expert or educated into appreciating jazz at the Philharmonic, or can one simply enjoy this type of music without being a jazz fan or... What would you call it? Audiophile? Well, the critics think it's acquired taste, but I think that you can like it without uh, working at it. Do you think that American jazz has reached its apex in the United States? Or is it yet to hit its high point in either popularity, appreciation, or as a form of musical art? I doubt that it's uh, reaching a peak as an art. I'm not at all enthused about some of the directions that jazz has taken today. So I uh, could subjectively say that I, I 
can't support that it's reaching any kind of a peak. It may have reached a plateau and not have progressed, or in some ways it may even have gone back. In terms of its commercial success, it's obviously uh, not only reached a peak, but daily reaches a higher peak. And then that spreads to the rest of the world. Do you think that jazz music has reached its zenith and is sort of dwindling now? Or will we ever see another era of the great jazz bands and swing orchestras? I hope so, but I am afraid that the economics are against it. Uh, I think that if that were to happen, and in some ways you find signs of that with the renaissance of Basie's band and I hope Ellington's and a few others, too few unfortunately, but I think if that were to happen, that uh, you might have a returning to the so-called golden era of jazz. Uh, to me, your jazz at the Philharmonic shows were so good in that they were improv and they involved some of the most talented jazz musicians that ever existed. From your perspective, is jazz at the Philharmonic patterned after any other jazz series? No, I, that's an original, well, it's not a, exactly an original idea. I simply took a jam session and glorified it and put it on a concert hall and called it um, a jazz concert. Its uh, basic idea is complete improvisation with emphasis on solo work. Um, it's reached its stage, I guess, because of organization more than necessarily musical content. This is probably a difficult question, but I'll ask it anyway. How do you go about selecting the music and the musicians for your jazz at the Philharmonic concerts? Well, I've always had two standards that I adhered to, contrary to what the, the critics of jazz at the Philharmonic have um, supposed all these years. I never hire anyone on my show whom I don't like musically. I pay him, however, on how well he draws but I don't hire anybody who can draw well if I don't like them musically. And as a result, there are a lot of groups that I could use as a businessman, but I never would because I um, can't accept them musically. On the other hand, there are many musicians I do have that if for no other reason I subjectively enjoy, and since I'm paying the tab, at least I should hear something I like. <laughs> I just can't pass up the opportunity to ask the great Norman Grants for a lesson in music. I'm sure our listeners would be overjoyed to have Mr. Grants delineate between swing, bop, rock and roll, Dixieland, and jazz. Would you do that for us, please? Well, uh, I think you'd have to first rule out jazz. I think that that's the main title. The others, uh, apart from rock and roll, are types of jazz. And I guess first you'd have to say what jazz is. To me, jazz is simply improvised music with syncopation. And the definition in terms of the syncopation, for example, in Dixieland, is that it's two-beat. The definition usually in swing is that it's 4-4. Four, four. Bop can have different kinds of tempi. It can be 6-8, 7-5, whatever that the drummer decides to do, because there isn't the emphasis on the reiteration of the time. The accent doesn't have to be constant as it is on two beat or four. Uh, harmonically, Dixieland has its own peculiar kind of counterpoint in which the horns play against each other. Uh, normally there isn't any kind of adhering to the melodic line and usually they play very simple chord changes. Bop, I'm taking these at random now, uh, is the most complex in terms of its chord changes. And again, for opposite reasons, uh, doesn't uh, hew to the melodic line. Swing, uh, which I suppose is best typified by big bands, sticks most closely to the melodic line and most closely to the stated tempo and stated beat so that you can most easily dance to it as well as understand it. Rock and roll uh, is uh, an offshoot of the simple blues. In fact, it's a conglomeration on the one hand of hillbilly music and on the other hand of the uh, most southern kind of blues, uh, almost work songs. And usually in rock and roll, 
it's either very slow or very fast, and either he's lost his sweetheart or he wants his sweetheart. That's the extent of it. Since we're on the topic of different musical genres, would you be so kind as to make a comment on present-day rock and roll? Well, uh, I think that the success of rock and roll, strangely enough, is... uh, is where it is because of the death of the big band because rock and roll at least provides such a good beat that you can dance to it and jazz today in many ways has emphasized not the beat but the harmonic and people can't dance to that especially younger people and rock and roll has provided them with what uh, earlier blues bands used to do so that it's very simple and easy uh, the lyrics of course are nonsense and I think that the lyrics too are so repetitious that they almost have a beat of their own Um, kind of um, euphemistic beat. But uh, uh, the only unfortunate thing is that it is so repetitive that finally it just becomes downright boring. Uh, Though I don't think that it's as um, bad as a lot of authorities paint it to be. I think that uh, that's blown way out of proportion. Now, I want to ask you two questions. First, what is or who is your favorite orchestra? And second, What is the most requested selection you've had in the various tours you've made, either here or abroad? Well, there are two orchestras that I uh, like, Duke Ellington and Count Basie. Uh, And each provides me with a different kind of an emotional charge. Ellington, I think, is a more musical band, and Basie certainly emphasizes the beat more than anyone else. Uh, The selection that we've been asked in the past to play most of all used to be How High the Moon but uh, at the present time it's Perdido however we assiduously avoid playing either one (laughs) and insist upon giving the people something that's new because the musicians are getting tired of playing both tunes You wouldn't happen to be the writer or the producer of Perdido? No, I wish I were unfortunately it's uh, Juan Tiesel who wrote it and uh, well, I don't know who published it Who, in your opinion, are the great interpreters of, let's say, New Orleans jazz? Well, I think the three greatest interpreters uh, are Kid Ory, Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, they're among the living, and I think uh, Jimmy Noon could be considered in that class, uh, who unfortunately has died. Who do you consider the great exponents of the Chicago jazz scene? Well, I actually, I'm not too um, familiar with that school because it's kind of an offshoot from the New Orleans school, and I suppose you could name Eddie Condon, Gene Krupa, Muggsy Spanier, Red Nichols, as well as any of them. Are there many European artists who you would consider to be as great as our American jazz musicians? No, I think in terms of the definition of a truly original and creative jazz artist, that apart from Django Reinhardt, I've never heard anyone uh, other than our own American people play really good creative jazz. You've taken jazz at the Philharmonic all over the world. Which type of music and which artists do the Europeans like the best? Well, the European, because he's conditioned by records and because uh, of the war is necessarily later than we are in hearing uh, records tends to like the older musicians you could almost break it down by country in England there's a a definite affinity for New Orleans jazz in Sweden a country that was neutral and had an opportunity to acquire records almost as they came out from this country you'll find uh, more of a liking for the modern things In France, uh, there's a tendency to like a musician primarily if he's a Negro musician. And as a result, um, their favorites, again, are with the older, more established Negro musicians and Negro bands. That's partially due to the critical tastes over there, and the critics in France have a lot to say about jazz, at least in conditioning the audiences. In Germany, because of AFN, I think that they're probably uh, more... uh, 
their tastes are more compatible with ours because in reality they hear things almost immediately when we do them and their tastes lie more with what is current today. Is there such a thing as a European type of jazz or Asiatic jazz? If so, what's the difference? Well, I would say that the jazz in Asia is completely imitative of our kind of jazz. They listen to our records and they copy them note for note. I, I haven't heard when we played over 1953 with jazz of the Philharmonic in Japan or in Hong Kong, did I hear anything that could be called at all original. In Europe, on the other hand, where they're not imitative, they're derivative. And so you find bands trying to sound like Stan Kenton, you find bands trying to sound like Duke Ellington, and you find soloists, uh, again, if they're not imitating, they're at least deriving their ideas and their concepts from our own soloists. Uh, I don't think that there's anything original in the field of jazz today outside of America. That's not chauvinistic, that's, uh, that's an observable fact. Why did you decide to have Ella Fitzgerald do a Cole Porter series? Is it because you consider Cole Porter a great jazz composer? Well, I think that no a composer can be called a, a great jazz composer. I think that Gershwin and Berlin, Rogers and Hart, Cole Porter, wrote tunes that uh, once interpreted in the hands of a good jazz artist could be termed jazz if played by a commercial singer or commercial group or commercial songs. In Ella's case, she's so versatile that whatever she does uh, comes out good. How do you account for Ella Fitzgerald bridging the gap between pop songs and jazz as well as she has? Well, Ella probably has a, a better foundation and has served a longer apprenticeship than any singer today. But still, even singers who are not as good a jazz singer as she is, for example, someone like Adaris Day, still uh, have done 10 to 15 years with big bands. I think that the big bands were the best uh, training grounds for not only instrumentalists, but for singers. Look at Frank Sinatra, for example, Crosby. Uh, they've all sung with big bands. They've learned how to, how to have a good musical ear. Unfortunately, the same can't be true for any of the modern singers or the ones who are commercially successful today. Now, you have had the pleasure of working with so many great jazz pianists. What individual characteristics are recognizable in the various jazz pianists as between Tatum, Wilson, Peterson, Garner? Could the average person detect a difference? Well, I think that uh, you can break down the qualities that define uh, a pianist, or for that matter, any um, instrument, in terms of whether the artist has good rhythmic qualities and the pianist that does he use his left hand. Secondly, uh, how he improvises about the melody. In Tatum's case, the improvisation can be incredible. In people like Bud Powell, it can be so much that you often, if you're a layman, lose the thread of the melody. In people like Teddy Wilson and Oscar Peterson and Errol Garner, there's more of a hewing to the melodic line. But I think that um, the differences are so readily apparent that listening to any artist a half a dozen times and then immediately listening to another pianist ought to give you the differences quite easily. You undoubtedly have some very interesting anecdotes about the great Art Tatum. Would you mind giving us one or two of them? Well, the anecdote that I'll always remember is that when I did that historic session with him, in which we did 150 sides and two recording dates, uh, I asked him after the first take if he wanted to hear a playback. And he said no. He knew when he made a mistake. And so we did 150 compositions, all one take, with no playbacks. At one juncture, I was so interested in what he was doing, and so was the engineer, that, that we ran out of tape. I would say about oh, 32 bars before the ending of a tune. And I actually was afraid to tell Art, but I had to because obviously we had to have the tune complete. And when I told him, he said, well, play me the last eight of what we had. And I played him the last eight bars, and he picked right up from there and did the same 32 bars over again. 
When one thinks of jazz music, one doesn't automatically think of jazz violin players. Why are there no jazz fiddle players around? I notice that, Mr. Grants, you've been concentrating on the woodwind boys and the brass players and a few of the percussion fellows, but no violin. Why not? Well, I think that uh, there are a couple of very good jazz artists who play a uh, violin. One of them also plays trumpet. I'm thinking of Ray Nance, for example, with Duke Ellington, who is an excellent violinist in the jazz medium, and the uh, French artist Stephen Graffelli, who played with Django Reinhardt, though I don't think he's at his peak now, still plays very good jazz. As a matter of fact, I heard him in Paris not so long ago, and he plays wonderfully. As one closely associated with musicians from many genres, what do you consider the professional life of a jazz musician as compared to, say, the life of a classical musician? Well, I would say that the uh, jazz musician achieves uh, commercial recognition far more quickly than the classical musician does because the demands upon the jazz musician technically are far less than with the classical musician. I would say in terms of um, soloists, the classical musician uh, probably uh, gets better as he matures, as he gets older. I think with jazz musicians, unfortunately, because of the uh, attitude on part of the public and on part of the press, seem to think that you must constantly seek someone new. It's always been a strange thing that uh, in jazz you find people like Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young, Louis Armstrong, Ellington, Count Basie, who actually are maturing, but instead the public and the press seeks new and younger faces. In classics, the opposite is true. I think, too, that in classics there's more emphasis because of the symphonies on uh, using well, what we would call a sideman. In jazz, because the big band is virtually dead, the man primarily must be a soloist. Now, we know that the jazz at the Philharmonic shows that you've been putting on are very popular. But I want to know, is jazz at the Philharmonic purely for American appeal, or is it slanted towards international appeal? You don't slant domestic as opposed to international. Uh, they're both the same. You could take a Swedish boy and move him to... Germany, or you can move him to the United States, and if he likes jazz there, he'll like jazz over here. Uh, fortunately, you set a show in this country, and it applies in its popularity uh, almost without any change in any other country in the world. Now, we know that jazz at the Philharmonic has been very successful, and you've had tours across North America and uh, to Europe, or most recently. I was wondering, do geographical differences enter into the selection and uh, appreciation, and even the requests of the jazz classics? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think that in the South, you probably, we don't play the South very often, but I would imagine the South probably would like the blues. I imagine the New England they would probably like the more modern things because of the classical background there. I know in the Midwest, particularly in Chicago, there's a great liking for Dixieland. The West Coast, though it's supposed to have spawned a, a school of jazz called West Coast Jazz, which I think is simply a, a label, but doesn't really represent any kind of, any particular school of jazz, probably likes all kinds of music. Would you be so kind as to tell our listening audience a little bit about what effect television has had on the public's appreciation of jazz? Well, I think it's lamentable the way television has completely either ignored jazz or has done so little for it as to make it almost inexcusable. I think that television has played it safe in terms of jazz and uh, not done anything for it, with possibly one exception, which would be Steve Allen, and Steve is a jazz fan, so he plays what he likes, subject to the controls of, over his show. But uh, I do believe that 
TV could do something to help jazz by simply presenting a good jazz show without any gimmicks or motives or reasons other than that it's good music. What medium exerts the most influence toward an appreciation of popular music? Oh, records by far, certainly. Uh, we try and with our concerts, there aren't enough of them, but I, we, we play maybe to a quarter of a million people a year in the States and possibly that much in Europe, but that doesn't begin to compare to what the disc jockey can do by playing records on the air or what the public can do in buying records. Gene Krupp is an excellent drummer. He's played in both big bands and in very small ensembles like trios. What do you think of Gene Krupa and small combos as opposed to the big bands? Well, though I record Gene uh, primarily in small groups, I prefer him with the big band. And I have a feeling that Gene probably prefers playing with the big band uh, instead of with the small group. Would you be so kind as to amplify this answer of yours in connection with the economics of large bands? Well, before the war started, the only place you could hear jazz was you, well, I shouldn't say the only place, but the place that you normally heard jazz was in the ballroom. You'd go dancing with your girl, or even if you didn't go with a girl, you would stand by the bandstand and listen to a jazz band. When the war began, uh, it was difficult, apart from the draft, but also from the salaries that sidemen uh, side were demanding, for a band leader to keep a big band intact and keep its quality high. And what happened was that at the same time, you had a, a rising of small nightclubs that could handle combinations, but not big bands. And they made it sufficiently lucrative for a sideman with any kind of a name to front a small combination and make far more than he could with a big band. He wouldn't have to do the one-night stands, and he could finally settle in one place. Unfortunately, it's reacted to in that any young musician, however half-baked his ideas and his abilities might be, immediately can get himself a job fronting a small combo in his local town or if he comes to New York or Chicago, rather than going with a big band. So that at the same time the quality of the big band fell, the competition of the nightclub rose, and the dance hall, which was the only place that the big band could survive, suffered. Now, in few places, that is, few nightclubs, you can hear a big band, but again, you have to sit. And I think a big band that can't have people standing and dancing in front of it soon loses whatever vigor and right it has to be called a big jazz band. How do DJs throughout the country react to your efforts? Violently. <laughs> what advice can you give to a young musician who wants to have a career in jazz? Some people I read recommend to young musicians that they go to a musical school of one sort or another. I don't think you can learn jazz in school or learn it out of a book. I think if it's possible, and here I may be contradicting myself because I admit that there aren't too many bands, but if it's possible for any young musician to play with any kind of a band, just so he learns the place of his particular instrument alongside other musicians, particularly in a section, say, if he were a trumpet player or a saxophone player or a rhythm section man. I think that after doing that as long as he could and playing in as many different bands as he could, then he would be ripe for trying his hand at doing solos, and after that uh, he could be called a jazz artist if he has any talent at all. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this attempt at recreating an interview with the great Norman Granz, circa 1956. This is Norman Granz speaking. It's been my pleasure to bring you Jazz at the Philharmonic, one of a series of programs which presents Ella Fitzgerald, Lester Young, Oscar Peterson, and other great stars of the jazz world. We hope you'll be with us to hear other jazz classics the next time the Jazz at the Philharmonic is presented over this station.